dun 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 it's the flat line SIBO test. Do you have a flat line SIBO test? And if so, does it mean you have hydrogen sulfide dysbiosis? We will find out together, won't we, in this video. Come along for the journey and the rant. All right, kiddo, buckle in for a wild ride because we're talking about the flat line SIBO test. For those of you who don't know, there's a speculation, a rumor, a thought, a, uh, a school of thought out there that a flatline SIBO test indicates hydrogen sulfide overgrowth. And the glory of this is that it allows us to make do with the two gas methodology that we've had for a number of years. So if you can't get the TRIO SMART test, if you live outside of the United States, for example, then this might be something that you are seriously considering when evaluating for SIBO. Um, but surprisingly, there's really very, very little research on this topic. And when I mean very little, I mean almost none. Um, I just tried to do a PubMed dive today on it because I thought I want to like be really clear and up to date for you guys. And honest to God, I found like two articles that talked about it and it was not super in depth. Um, one of them, I mean, I can link them if you want below, just ask for them. Um, one of them was a study on IBD, if I remember correctly, and one was a study out of India. Um, but, you know, it's, it's interesting because it gets talked about a lot. Like, you, you research SIBO for long enough, and there's going to be some talk of the flatline test. I'm in a SIBO clinicians group, and there's a lot of talk about flatline tests. Um, I've seen people who worked with other providers before working with me, and they've been told that they had a flatline test. And what I find is most often the case is that it's not a true flatline. It's just a negative SIBO test. Now, what do I mean by a flatline? So for those of you who don't know, what we would typically see on a SIBO test would be um, a baseline data point. Say, say at baseline, I'm just going to do one gas just for simplicity's sake, FYI. But say you have a baseline gas production of like two parts per million. And then you get another data point, and then let's say it goes, whoosh. oh, that didn't come out as good as I wanted, there, whoosh. And now you have a rise of say 20 parts per million. And then maybe it peters out and then it goes back down. What is typically thought to be the classic humdinger, we know this is SIBO, is a pattern where you have a low or normal baseline and you get a peak and then it, it peters out for a little while and then maybe by the 90 or 120 mark you start to get another peak. The double peak is what's talked about as like as good as it gets with SIBO breath testing. This is SIBO and we know it because there's a pocket of bacteria producing gas right here early on before we hit the 90 minute mark where we would think it's probably in the small intestine. And then we get the second peak, which is indicative of the colonic microbiome. Because remember, you have a lot of microbiome living in your colon as well. And when you drink these sugar substrates, some of it's gonna hit the colon. So this double peak is what's really indicative of, of SIBO. Particularly, we're gonna see this more with lactulose as opposed to glucose. The, a negative SIBO test would oftentimes look something like this, where you have like low, low to normal gas production, maybe in the couple part per million range, but it's not exceeding the threshold. So for example, most labs say that you need a difference between baseline and the highest value of like 20 parts per million for hydrogen. And I forget if it's three or 10, it depends on the lab sometimes for methane, uh, but let's just say 10 for, for sake of argument, because I forget off the top of my head. But so you might have little fluctuations, couple parts per million here or there in the small bowel, that's all normal. And then you would get a rise once the sugar substrate hits the colon. Again, usually it's like somewhere around like the 90 to 120 mark, maybe plus or minus. There are some SIBO tests out there that go all the way out to three hours. So that's where you would definitely see this if you're using lactulose. Um, but sometimes you see it much earlier, like 60, 75, 90 minutes, depending on, on the person. So this is what we would typically see. We would see low 
to moderate gas production coming from the microbiome in the small bowel. And then once the sugar substrate hits the colon, then we would see this and we would see this rise in gas production because it's hitting the colon. A flatline test is not, not when you have low, low or minimal gas production here. A flatline test is when you have low or no gas production all the way. So where you would normally see a spike in colonic fermentation and gas production, you don't get that with the flat line. That's why it's called a flat line, because there's no spike at the end for the colon. Now, assuming you have a colon, which I don't know, some of you guys might not, because that is a thing that happens, um, you know, surgically, of course, but this would be a flat line. So you would be basically at like zero or one for your gas production all throughout the test, including the part of the test where we start getting into colon territory. That's the part of the flat line that makes it weird because we would expect some sort of fermentation and gas production once you get the sugar substrate to the colon. That's what makes it odd. Um, I have seen numerous cases, and I'll put one on the screen if I can figure out in the editing how to do it. I hope I don't forget to do that. Um, I've seen a lot of tests where people are told that they have a flat line SIBO test and they come to me thinking that they're absolutely doomed because the hydrogen sulfide protocols are not working. And it turns out that they're just, you know, they're cruising around here and then they do get a spike. Or maybe they have like a little, a little teeny peak here, but it's not above the threshold. Like maybe they get 10 parts per million hydrogen and it's not, it's not significant. It's not indicative of SIBO. Guys, this would just be a negative SIBO test. Even, even if the peak is less than what I drew here, like say, say you had a SIBO breath test that had, you know, a little five or 10 part per million peak here. And then maybe that was the end of your test. That's still not a flat line. There's still gas production happening here at the colon. And this is still within the realm of normal for small bowel fermentation and microbial uh, gas production. So the thing with the flatline test is A, we have precious little to no research indicating that it actually indicates hydrogen sulfide overgrowth. Again, I found two articles and they, they weren't focusing explicitly on the flatline um, and really like dissecting it and looking at aspirates. It would be really great if we had aspirate results compared with SIBO breath test results and we could compare that to hydrogen sulfide in like a trio smart test or something like that, but there hasn't been a study like that as of yet. Um, so right now we're still very much questioning whether the flatline test is indicative of hydrogen sulfide, but the bigger problem that I want you guys to know about is that a lot of people, including practitioners, unfortunately, are misdiagnosing people with a flatline SIBO test when it is just a negative SIBO test. These are two different things. Don't confuse a negative SIBO test with a flatline. Flatline should be absolutely flat, like one, two parts per million absolute maximum on that or zero all the way through. And there should be no spike whatsoever when you get to the colon territory. That's what's indicative of the flatline and maybe that's indicative of hydrogen sulfide. Interestingly enough, I don't know why I'm holding that. Um, interestingly enough, uh, Lucy Mailing has a course on hydrogen sulfide that is wonderful. It may be a little bit thick for the average user, but for clinicians, certainly it was a really good little course. And she talked about a study, I think it was a 2008 study, where they were looking at hydrogen sulfide in exhaled breath. And they said that of the, I think, 56 odd people who exhaled hydrogen sulfide, again, maybe not overgrowth level, but they exhaled some amount of hydrogen sulfide. Of those people, about half of them, I think 32 of them, also exhaled hydrogen. So the idea that like the hydrogen's getting gobbled up and turned into hydrogen sulfide and that's why you would get a flatline test. Um, I don't know, about 50% of the people who exhaled hydrogen sulfide also exhaled hydrogen in that study. Now that being said, that is from Lucy's notes. I actually read the whole study. I, I went backwards and forwards over it. I looked at it. I even did a, a search in the PDF for it. I cannot find what she's talking about. 
So I don't know if she contacted the principal investigator or the researchers on her own and got that information, but there was nowhere in the article that said that 56 people exhaled hydrogen sulfide and 32 of those 56 also exhaled hydrogen. So I don't know where she's getting that from, or maybe I missed it somehow. Um, but for what it's worth, per Lucy Mailing and her course, in that one study, about 50% of the people with hydrogen sulfide production also exhaled hydrogen. So I don't know. I really, I don't know if we can use this as a way to diagnose hydrogen sulfide. I want to, I, I really want to, because I know that a lot of you don't live in the United States and you don't have access to TrioSmart. And it would be really helpful if we could just deduce this from this test, but I really don't know if that's a viable option in truth. And I wish we had more data to support it. But at the bare minimum, just know the difference between a negative SIBO test and a, a true flatline test. And now that I perhaps took the wind out of your sails and you're wondering, crap, what do I do? Well, first of all, I've got a, a gajillion videos on here that you can check out. The IBS Freedom Podcast has a lot of info for you. But if you want to just like kind of trim the fat and get down to the point and figure out how to heal your body and you don't want to go through and watch 240 odd YouTube videos and 100 plus podcast episodes, FODMAP Freedom is going to be enrolling really soon in the month of August. So if you have enjoyed the wait list for that, make sure you do that now. This is the last time we're doing FODMAP Freedom for the year. So if you're a bit on the fence thinking about it, if you don't get in in the August class, you'll need to wait until 2023. I would love to support you and help you weed through the bullshit and just find the answers and find the clarity you need so that you can heal your gut, heal your body, and never have to think about the word SIBO again. So I put the link down in the description. I'll try to remember to put it in the first comment as well, but check out the link. I would be so happy to help you in FODMAP Freedom and answer your questions in our live Q and A's. And I will see you in the next video. Hey guys, if you like this video, be sure to subscribe, ring the bell, click the like button and leave a comment down below with the videos that you would like to see me do next. Doing all of those really helps support the channel and support my efforts in making as many videos as possible for you guys. Thanks so much and I'll see you in the next video.